Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. This talk is called Fall Prevention and Helpful Tips. So my goal is to provide you with some helpful tips today and action steps that you can do to reduce the risk of falling. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now. Okay, can you see my presentation up here? Yes. Okay, great. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, fall prevention with helpful tips is the name of the talk. San Diego County has a task force called the Fall Prevention Task Force. How many of you have heard of that? It's a partnership between the public health aspect of San Diego County government, which is the uh, area agency on aging, and then private healthcare providers like myself, as well as other senior service providers. So anyone that provides services to older adults in San Diego County may be a participant on this task force. And we partner with the county uh, in order to provide resources and education to residents of San Diego. Our goal and mission, as you see on this slide, is to reduce falls and their devastating consequences in San Diego County. If you wanna learn more about the Fall Prevention Task Force, you can go to our website, sandiegofallprevention.org. We do have a speakers bureau, which I'm part of, and that's one of the reasons I speak around the county on this topic. And I'm so honored to be here today with you. Thank you so much for inviting me back. We're gonna start off this talk on fall prevention with four, excuse me, three common myths about falls. So these are, these are pieces of information that people say about falls in older adults. We're talking about people over 65 years old. That's what I'm talking about when I say older adults. And then we're gonna dispel these myths. That's how we'll start today. So. The first myth is that muscle strength and flexibility cannot be regained as you're aging. And that's just not true. It is true that with normal aging, everybody loses muscle strength and muscle mass. That is part of normal aging. However, through exercise, muscle strength and flexibility can be regained. The second myth is that if somebody stays home, they can avoid falling. And we see this a lot. If an older adult has one or two falls, then their friends, their neighbors, or their children will tell them, well, just don't go out anymore. Just stay home and then you won't fall again. But the reality is that most falls happen by slipping or tripping on a level surface inside your own home. Therefore, staying home not, does not necessarily prevent someone from falling. So that's a common myth. The third common myth about falls is that falling is a normal part of aging. And that's just not true. There are plenty of people who are well over 65 that are not falling. And there are certain reasons for that. So there are certain risk factors that predispose people to have falls when they get over 65 years old. And then there, but there are some people that don't start falling. And so a lot of times it's because they don't have those risk factors. So we're going to talk about the risk factors associated with falls today. And that will be the source of the helpful tips that I will offer, which will be about how to modify the risk factors that make it more likely for someone to fall once they turn 65 or older. So how many people are falling over the age of 65? Right now, the statistic is about one out of every four older adults reports falling annually. And this is not necessarily the people who are seeking out medical care. This information was gathered from a health survey that was conducted by the phone. So they just called people over 65 and interviewed them and so not everyone in this statistic is actually seeking out medical care as a result of the fall. These are just people that are reporting that they have fallen within the last year. And of those who fall, about 50% of those folks will fall again within six months. 
And for that reason, it's, imp it's imperative to take action steps to reduce the risk of future falls, especially if you've already had one fall. Falls are the number one reason why older adults are unable to return home or live alone again after being in the hospital. And they're the number one reason why people break their hip. So we really want to prevent falling, especially for people with osteoporosis or osteopenia who are more likely to break a bone if they fall. So we're gonna talk about four major categories of how to prevent falling. Now, the reality is that anyone can fall at any time, and that includes people of any age. So a younger person, a teenager, for example, could um, be out skateboarding and have a fall, for example. So falls occur at any age, but they're most concerning when the person is over 65 because they're more likely to get injured, and like I said, after that, they may not be able to return home or live alone again, or they may sustain a serious injury like a brain injury or a hip fracture or a broken wrist. Uh, there's all kinds of serious injuries that happen to older adults when they fall. And that's why we're focused on this topic uh, today. So there's four general areas that we're going to cover today. The first one is speak up. And this has to do with working with your doctor, your primary care doctor, or your general practitioner. The second is to keep moving. And that is the importance of staying active when you're over 65 because of the normal loss of muscle mass and muscle strength that is part of normal aging. So we have to fight back against that. The third key area that we're gonna talk about today is to make sure you get your eyes checked on a regular basis because vision problems do predispose people to falls. And then we'll talk about the home environment and how to make your home more safe, since we know that most falls occur from slipping or tripping on a level surface inside your own home. So the first area that we're gonna talk about is how to work effectively with your primary care doctor, call it your PCP or your general practitioner. Some people call that your GP. Now that might be a doctor, that might be a physician assistant, or that might be a nurse practitioner. This is whoever is doing your primary care. So in regards to fall risk, people with certain chronic health conditions are at a higher risk of falling. What are those conditions? I'm gonna just have you think, think for a minute on your own about what chronic health condition that might make someone more likely to fall. Okay, now you've had a moment to think of it on your own. I'll give you some clues. First of all, high blood pressure or any cardiac condition can cause dizziness, can cause people to fall. Sometimes if someone's on a medication for high blood pressure, that can cause side effects of causing your blood pressure to drop after you stand up too quickly. So it can be both the chronic condition itself or the medication side effects for that chronic condition that may put someone at a higher risk of falling. Another example, arthritis. If someone has pain in their knee or their hip or their back or their foot, they might walk differently. They might limp a little bit and that may put them at a higher risk of falling if they have arthritis, if they have pain. Sometimes certain neurological conditions put people at a higher risk of falling like Parkinson's disease, or a history of a stroke, for example. Somebody who's battling with cancer may be weak from chemotherapy, and that could put them at a higher risk of falling. So there's many very different health conditions uh, that can predispose someone to falling. And then the medications that may be prescribed for certain health conditions can also cause side effects that may cause someone to fall. So we wanna work, the solution here is to work closely with your primary care provider to make sure that you're managing your chronic health conditions the best possible way and discuss any potential side effects that you're noticing from your medications. For example, for certain cardiac conditions, there's different medications that might be prescribed. And so if you feel like, 
a, a medication you're on is giving you a lot of side effects, you can discuss that with your doctor and see if that's the best medicine for you, or if maybe there could be a different medication you could take that would still accomplish the goal, but have fewer side effects for you. So everybody's different. Two people can take the exact same medication. One person might have no side effects. One person might have side effects. So you have to talk to your doctor and speak up and make sure that you're doing the best job you can to take your medications correctly, um, to notify your doctor of any side effects and to stay on top of your chronic health conditions. Here are some specific things you can talk to your primary care provider about. First of all, you can ask them if any of your medications or supplements may be contributing to your fall risk. You can uh, take a bag of all your medications or a list of all your medications to your appointment and ask your primary care provider to look over everything you're taking. You can also take that to a pharmacy and make an appointment with a pharmacist to go over everything you're taking and just make sure um, if there's anything, for example, sometimes people get prescribed medication by two different doctors and so they're on double medication for the same condition. So you just wanna make sure that somebody knows everything you're taking from every provider that prescribes to you and every pharmacy that you get, because some people might have certain medications delivered in the mail and then maybe other medications they pick up at the local pharmacy. So it's possible that nobody knows all the medications and supplements you're taking. So it is a good idea to keep your primary care provider informed if another doctor has prescribed something for you. So they can just keep an eye on your medications and make sure to reduce your risk of falling as much as possible. The second thing that you can talk to your doctor about is if your current health conditions could be contributing to your risk of falling. For example, if you're having vision problems, that can contribute to your risk of falling. So maybe you need a referral to an ophthalmologist, an eye doctor. If you're having heart problems, that can contribute to the risk of falling. So maybe you need a referral to cardiology. For example, if you're having depression, interestingly, depression can contribute to the risk of falling. And so you could have a mental health referral potentially. So these are all examples of referrals that your primary care provider might make to other specialized providers in order to deal with chronic health conditions and minimize your risk of falling. Another referral might be to a neurologist if you're having numbness or tingling or dizziness, things like that. If you're having trouble getting around, having trouble walking, having trouble getting on and off the toilet or in and out of the shower or in and out of the car, your doctor may refer you to physical therapy or occupational therapy. So those are all examples of good referrals to reduce the risk of falling from chronic health conditions. Another good question, I'm over here on number four on this slide, is to ask your doctor after you get your annual physical and your annual blood work and your doctor reviews your blood work results, your lab results, you can ask them if you need to be taking any supplements, common supplements, maybe calcium, vitamin D, iron, B12. Those are common supplements that people have to take depending on how much nutrition they get in their regular diet. So that should be decided by your primary care provider based on the results of your blood work. So if you haven't seen your doctor recently, you can schedule an annual physical. Medicare calls it an annual wellness exam and just get your blood work and make sure that your vitamin levels are not deficient. And then the final thing you can talk to the doctor about is what type of exercise should you be doing? Now we know, and we've already discussed, that normal aging causes a loss of muscle mass and a loss of muscle strength, but you can gain that back through exercise. So that's why it's important to know what kind of exercise you can do. You wanna do exercise that will build strength, balance, flexibility, and endurance. And so if you've never exercised before in your life, you might not know what type of exercise to do. You can ask your doctor what's most appropriate for you. And if the doctor's still not sure, they can refer you to physical therapy, which can get you started with an exercise program that's safe 
based on your medical or surgical history. So first things first, I encourage you to speak up when you're working with your primary care provider in all these different ways to make sure you manage your chronic health conditions proactively and monitor medication side effects, make sure somebody knows all the medications you're on. In San Diego County, we have a program called uh, Healthier Living with Chronic Health Conditions. And that was one of the handouts I sent to have distributed to you today. So you can look, it's a free program where they'll teach you how to live healthy with diabetes, for example, or uh, pain. Um, and so they have any, any chronic health condition, they have an evidence-based free class series where they teach you how to live the most healthy that you can with a chronic health condition. So that's a good resource if your doctor doesn't have a lot of time to talk to you about all this. When you visit the doctor for your annual wellness exam, typically through Medicare or your annual physical, we'll call it, Medicare requires the doctor to ask you questions about your fall risk. And these are typically the questions they're required to answer. They have to ask you, have you fallen in the past year? Do you feel unsteady when standing or walking? And do you worry about falling? These three questions are required by Medicare or your health insurance for the doctor to ask you during your annual exam. Now, why do we wanna ask these questions? Because we wanna to try to prevent you from falling and incurring a very expensive episode of healthcare if you get injured from falling. So typically, if if somebody answers yes to one of these three questions, the doctor should do some kind of an intervention to reduce the risk of falling. The key thing here for you to know is that you have to be honest with this. A lot of people try to minimize their fear of falling. They try to hide or cover up if they feel unsteady or unsafe with standing and walking. And if they've fallen, they don't tell anybody and they just try to keep it a secret. So those are not helpful behaviors. So the tip here is when, when you go in for your annual checkup and your doctor asks you these questions, make sure you're honest about the truth regarding this. And then hopefully the doctor will do some kind of an intervention um, to help you prevent the risk of falling in the future. So that's the first area that we were gonna discuss, which is speaking up while you're working with your primary care provider. The second area we're gonna to cover today is that it's important to keep moving when you're retired. So a lot of people think that after they retire, they're just gonna kind of lounge around and watch TV and catch up on their shows, things like that people become much more sedentary in retirement because they don't have a schedule that they have to stick to. But I'll tell you something I've said at countless talks I've given around the county of San Diego on how to prevent falling, which is when you're retired, you need to schedule your life around your physical fitness activities. Or if you don't, then you're most likely going to be scheduling around all kinds of doctor's appointments. So it's kind of one or the other. So we want to um, try to be physically active and that can look like individual fitness, that can look like a group activity, that can look like a workout buddy that you might find, you might go to a personal trainer, you might have physical therapy. So that looks different for every person, but what we wanna to try to avoid is just kind of having a blank schedule with no activities and therefore we just sit around all day and watch TV. That's not going to be helpful in retirement because of the normal loss of muscle strength. Staying active is very important. Also, interestingly, fear of falling, research has shown that when someone's afraid of falling, they actually shorten the length of their steps and they shorten the pace with which they walk. They, they reduce their walking speed and therefore it actually changes how they walk. And that actually does increase the risk of falling. So it's very interesting to understand that fear of falling causes someone to change the way that they walk 
And that change increases the likelihood that they're going to fall. And that's why if someone is afraid of falling, it's important to do an intervention. Most likely the intervention will be a referral to physical therapy. So let's talk about footwear. In order to stay active, you have to definitely select the right shoes. I've met multiple older adults who fell because, for example, they were going to the theater or they were going to the opera and especially the ladies they had on their high heels or the guys they had on their dress shoes with the slick, uh, slippery bottom on the dress shoes. So when we look at preventing falls and being safe when you're over 65, we want to try to avoid anything with a heel, avoid anything like in the middle of this picture, that work boot is too heavy. The sole is too thick. And we want to select footwear all the way off to the side of this slide that has a thin non-skid sole that's uh, flat, no heels, and not too thick of a sole. And then it needs to securely fasten to your foot. So flip-flops and slippers are actually dangerous to walk around in because they can slip off your feet. So you want to have something that either slips on like this gentleman is putting on um, shoes that he kind of hooks around his heel here, or you can use shoes that have Velcro or shoelaces. And some people will even get elastic shoelaces that stretch when you put the shoe on and then they contract to fit snugly. So that's really important to pick the proper footwear because Footwear can actually cause falls if you're not wearing the right shoes. And then we want to try to stay active day to day. So I remember I did a talk one time at the Bonita Library down in San Diego, and a woman raised her hand and she said, I clean my house every day from top to bottom. I vacuum, I sweep, I dust, I do the dishes, I do the laundry. She said, does that count as physical activity? Yes. Absolutely, it does. So if you're out doing housekeeping or you're out doing grocery shopping or you're out doing gardening, that all counts as physical activity because you're not just sitting on the couch like a bump on the log. So we want you, the idea would be to keep moving, keep physically active. And if you need to take rest breaks, that's fine. So you might pace out your day and say, I'm going to go work in the garden for an hour or 30 minutes, and then I'm going to come inside and sit on the couch and rest and watch my favorite show. Okay, and then I'm going to go out and go to the grocery store, and then I'm going to come home and rest again. So sometimes if you don't have a lot of energy, you can plan how to pace out your schedule and plan rest breaks throughout the day. But the key is to include physical activity in your day-to-day -day lifestyle, and then even some form of exercise. So this is an example showing you a woman gardening and then showing you a group that's going jogging together. Now, um, you know, stationary biking is very popular. Um, group activity like water aerobics is very popular. Sometimes dancing is popular. Um, walking on the treadmill is not safe for everybody, but is popular for people who have good uh, coordination of their legs and good balance. So you can exercise at a gym. You could exercise at your house. You could do a group class. You could do a workout buddy, uh, meet someone to go for a walk, for example, or you could exercise with a personal trainer, which you most likely have to pay out of pocket for, or you can ask a referral for physical therapy from your primary care provider. And that's typically covered by insurance they can get you started with a home exercise program. So again, if you're not sure what exercise is the best for you, I cannot advise you on that because I don't know the extent of your medical conditions or any surgeries that you've had, but you can talk to your doctor and find out what type of exercise might be appropriate or request a referral to physical therapy to get started on that. The key thing is that we wanna avoid the sedentary lifestyle, which ultimately can increase the risk of falling. So I've mentioned physical therapy a couple times. I am a licensed physical therapist. And the general uh, slogan that we use here in California for physical therapy is that it improves the way you move. So physical therapists can help train people to how to get out of bed, how to get up off the chair, how to get in and out of the car, how to walk with a cane or a walker, and then how to do exercise for balance, for strengthening, for flexibility, and for endurance. 
and then set you up with what's called a home exercise program, which is a fitness plan when they discharge you so that you would continue the exercises, but you're no longer necessarily going to the physical therapy. So physical therapy is frequently covered by insurance if your primary care doctor makes the referral and you can receive physical therapy. Of course, if you end up in the hospital, they usually provide physical therapy in the hospital. Um, you can receive physical therapy typically uh, at a clinic. So you can leave your house and go to what's called an outpatient clinic where you would drive or have someone else drive you to a physical therapy clinic that might be within a hospital. So say you go to Scripps or you go to Sharp or you go to UCSD and you go to the physical therapy outpatient clinic for physical therapy at the hospital, or you could go to a private physical therapy practice, which is like what I have, I have a private physical therapy practice in Encinitas. It's not associated with a hospital. It's just in the middle of uh, a building with other healthcare providers. So you could go to a private practice or you could go to a hospital-based clinic when you leave your house and go to physical therapy. If you end up in an inpatient situation, like in a nursing home or in a hospital, they will typically provide you with therapy. And then you can also receive physical therapy usually in the privacy of your own home. So for people that are homebound, meaning they cannot safely leave the house or it's a considerably taxing effort for them to leave the house, then the doctor can refer physical therapy to come into the home and that's through Medicare-based home health services. Typically you can get PT, maybe OT, maybe a home nurse, and whatever you need to be taken care of in the home through your insurance. Also, there are a lot of providers now that are offering physical therapy in the home through Medicare Part B. And the reason that's interesting is because that way the patient doesn't have to be considered homebound. So to receive physical therapy under Medicare Part A, you have to be deemed homebound by your doctor. So your doctor has to certify that it's a considerable and taxing effort for you to leave the home in order for Medicare Part A to pay for you to have in-home therapy. But if you're not homebound, but you still would like to receive physical therapy in your home just for the convenience of it, then you can have someone come out through Medicare Part B. And there's a bunch of different colleagues of mine that I know, for example, who are now offering in-home physical therapy services under Medicare Part B for non-homebound older adults. So that's another good option. And then of course, you always have the option to pay out of pocket for physical therapy services. If, you, if your insurance won't cover it, or if, if you've already reached the limits of what your insurance will allow, typically Medicare usually allows about 20 visits per year per person for physical therapy. So if, you, um, if you've reached the limit or your insurance just won't cover your, your physical therapy for some reason, you can always pay out of pocket for physical therapy as well. So for example, my practice, I don't take any insurance. All my patients are private pay. And, um, and so when people contact me and they want to use their insurance, I refer them to other physical therapists who do take insurance and there are plenty of them around, but it's always an option to pay for private physical therapy as well. So within the field of physical therapy, I want to just orient you to the fact that there are specialists similar to medicine where, you know, you've got your general primary care provider but then you've got the neurologist or you've got the cardiologist or you've got the ear, nose and throat doctor, right? So within physical therapy, which is a profession that I'm part of, we have specialists as well. So we have some physical therapists that specialize in working with children, for example, they're called pediatric physical therapists. We have some physical therapists that specialize in sports related injuries. Those are sports medicine, physical therapists or orthopedic physical therapists. So I just wanna orient you to the type of specialty that I have, and you can find a few different people around San Diego with this specialty. It's called a vestibular physical therapist. Now, why is this important to fall prevention? Because we vestibular physical therapists specialize in working with people that have dizziness, vertigo, balance problems, and chronic falls. What that means is, if you've already gone to physical therapy for your balance and you're still having problems, 
chances are you might have a vestibular health issue that was overlooked. The vestibular system is the inner ear. So if you take your fingers and you touch your cheekbone right in front of your ear holes on both sides, okay, now relax your hands. That's your where your vestibular system is. It's inside these cheekbones. And so when you turn your head or you look down or you look up or you lie down in your bed, roll over in bed, all those sorts of things, bend over, stand up, your vestibular system is moving around through space anytime your head moves around. And if you have a vestibular problem that has not been addressed or even identified by your doctor or your physical therapist, then chances are you're still going to be having balance problems and falls. Even if you're doing strengthening of your muscles and stretching and balance training, because a lot of times the inner ear, the vestibular system needs to be addressed. And so that would be a reason to go to a vestibular physical therapist specifically. If you have uh, done regular physical therapy and you're still having balance problems, or if you're having dizziness or vertigo, or if you're having chronic unexplained falls. Because vestibular physical therapists do a root cause analysis. So this is what I do with my patients to figure out what is the root of this balance problem? What is this? What's going on here? Is it an inner ear problem? Do you have neuropathy in your feet, for example? What's going on? And so they actually do a root cause analysis that's more in depth than general physical therapy. They actually, uh, vestibular physical therapists actually do a hands-on exam, which has been shown to be superior to MRI and other diagnostic testing in many cases of people with chronic balance problems or chronic dizziness. And then you can, if this sounds interesting to you, uh, you can find a vestibular provider on this website, vestibular.org, which is a nonprofit organization that advocates for people with dizziness, vertigo, and chronic balance problems. So for example, I'm a provider listed on that website because I pay an annual fee to be listed on that website and be a member of this organization. And so you could go on there, vestibular.org, and you can search for a healthcare provider. They have a link to do that. And you just type in your zip code and then the radius of how far you're willing to travel. And it'll pop up for you who is trained in treating vestibular problems. So that's how you can find a vestibular physical therapist or a doctor that might be able to help you. If you have chronic falls, if you have unexplained balance problems, or you have dizziness or vertigo. And so those are all tips on how to keep moving. So, so far we've covered how to speak up with your doctor, different tips regarding that. We've covered tips on how to keep moving. And now we're gonna cover tips regarding vision, which is a huge fall risk factor for older adults. Now, what's going on with vision when people are over 65? Well, first of all, there's a lot of eye diseases, right? So. Most eye diseases are occurring in people over 65, and that would be like cataracts, for example, uh, macular degeneration, glaucoma, and diabetic retinopathy. Those are the top four. So research has shown that first eye cataract surgery actually reduces the risk of falling. So if you have cataracts and your doctor's recommending surgery, you may want to seriously consider that. Uh, if that's a good idea for you, that could reduce your risk of falling if the surgery is successful. Sometimes people have medications or eye drops they're given to manage glaucoma, macular degeneration, et cetera. If you have diabetic retinopathy, most certainly they'll be talking to you about how to manage your blood sugar levels. And so you want to stay on top of those eye diseases. And if you have, if you need, you can schedule with an ophthalmologist to monitor you regularly for your eye health. And then you wanna get your vision, get your eyes checked regularly um, to make sure that you have the right glasses and appropriate eyewear because vision does change with normal aging. So it is part of normal aging that people have impaired depth perception. They have impaired ability to see colors things start to look more like a grayscale, for example. And so there are normal changes with aging that happen to everybody, 
regardless if they have an eye disease or not. So if you have been diagnosed with an eye disease, as I said on the last slide, you probably want to have an ophthalmologist that you're working with that's a specialized doctor for eye health. But regardless, even if you don't have an eye disease, everybody over 65 is going to need to get their eyes checked regularly to make sure that you have the proper glasses. So the recommendation is typically to get your eyes checked once a year. But if you have something like diabetes that's sort of out of control and the blood sugar levels are fluctuating, your doctor may advise you to get your eyes checked more often, like every six months or something like that. Another uh, issue that occurs is sometimes um, people get prescribed progressive lenses, bifocals or trifocals, and they can cause falls when you're trying to climb up steps, ramps, or curbs. Because if you look down through the lower part of your lens, then that will give you a magnification that's supposed to be for reading distance. And so when you're trying to walk up and down curbs, steps, or ramps, but you're wearing your bifocals, trifocals, or progressive lenses, you have to be very careful to either look underneath the glasses or tip your whole head downwards so that you're looking through the top part of the lens and then you can gauge the depth perception for taking those steps. So for example, my grandma fell on the curb uh, at CVS shortly after getting new trifocal lenses because she looked down through the reading part of her lens, she didn't realize the magnification was different and therefore she missed the step, she missed the curb and she fell and skinned her elbow and her knee. Now she didn't need to go to the doctor cause she didn't break anything, but she was in a lot of pain from skinning her elbow and skinning her knee. And sometimes those small bumps and bruises or skin tears are actually more painful than fractures um, because of all the nerve endings in our skin. So it is important to make sure that you Take caution if you're using bifocals, trifocals, or progressive lenses, especially if they're new. And you can either hold on to a handrail or um, you can tip your head down to look through the top part of the lens to go up and down a curb, a step, or an incline. Or you can slightly lift the glasses up and look under them if your vision's good enough to see what's going on so that you're not looking through the reading lens when you're trying to go up and down curbs, steps, or inclines. So that's the section on vision. It's important to monitor your eye health and important to have the right glasses to get your glasses checked regularly and then take caution if you have bifocals, trifocals, or progressive lenses and you're going up and down steps, curbs, or inclines. Now we're going to move on to the fourth and final section of helpful tips, which is regarding your home environment. So I said at the very beginning that most falls happen by slipping and tripping on a level surface inside your own home. Therefore, making sure your home is set up the best possible way to prevent falling is really important. And so one key point here is that sometimes a home environment that's worked for you for your whole life may no longer be adequate once you're over 65 because of the normal changes with aging. So for example, you can see this puddle on the floor on one of these pictures. When people were younger, if they slipped on a puddle, they could probably take a quick couple steps and catch themselves before they fall. But with normal aging, our balance reactions are more delayed. So it takes longer for us to catch our balance if we lose our balance by slipping on a wet floor, for example. Now that's something that can be improved through training, through exercise, through physical therapy to train your balance reactions. But most older adults are not engaged in that kind of training. So therefore their balance reactions would be delayed. So it's even more important to make sure the floor is not wet, that any puddles or spills on the floor get cleaned up. And especially I've had a number of people who have slipped when their housekeeper was over um, mopping the floor or, or doing wax on the hardwood floor or something like that. So if someone's shining your floor, buffing your floor, waxing your floor or mopping your floor, that would be a time when the, the risk of falling would be much higher and you wanna take caution to either avoid walking on that slippery floor or walk more carefully, spread your feet out wider, maybe hold on to somebody for support. 
Another example of a normal change with aging that makes certain home environments less suitable for people is that as we get older, we need more light to see what we used to be able to see without with less light. So this is an example. Uh, it shows this uh, house where the lighting is barely coming in through the curtains and the lighting in the room is too dim. So younger people can usually see very well in environments like this, but the aging eye needs more light. So sometimes people have to um, install light bulbs that have uh, more brightness and uh, maybe increase the number of lights in their room. So maybe add lighting or increase the brightness of the light bulbs you're using, uh, maybe open the curtains more. And then along with that, um, people are more sensitive to glare when they're older as well. So um, you could put, um, you know, basically you just want to be cautious if you have a lot of glare around your house and come up with strategies on how to minimize the glare, but increase and improve the lighting. And that can reduce the risk of falling. Um, there's a picture here of a whole bunch of clutter and you can see all that stuff piled up on the table there is a tendency, especially when people downsize from their home that they've been in for such a long time into a smaller apartment or a senior living community, there is a tendency to want to keep all your furniture and just kind of squish everything into your smaller living space. And I would say that is that can cause falls because especially if you have to use a walker, you may not be able to get through your kitchen, for example, without turning sideways and kind of shuffling through narrow walkways. So if and when you downsize into an apartment or into a smaller living space, it's really important to get rid of some stuff, donate it um, or give it to your, you know, your children, your grandchildren, your neighbors, your friends because I've seen people try to cram all their furniture and all their stuff into a smaller space. And it really does increase the risk of falling if there's just too much clutter everywhere. You wanna make sure the walkways are not cluttered. And then um, in the bottom right corner here, it does show someone tripping on a throw rug. So that is pretty common for people to slip or trip on throw rugs, also electrical cords. So those should be either removed or secured so that uh, you can use, for example, double-sided tape on the bottom of your throw rug, or you can get a non-skid mat to put in between the rug and the floor so that it won't uh, slip when you step on it. So throw rugs and electrical cords should definitely be secured or removed from the walkways to reduce the risk of falling. There are some tips and strategies specific to each room of the house that you can use to make your home safer. And I did provide what's called a home safety checklist as a handout for all the participants in this webinar. That home safety checklist is from the San Diego County Fall Prevention Task Force. So you can find that um, in the handouts for the webinar and you can print it out or just open it up on your device and kind of walk around your house and say, okay, what do I need to do to make my home environment more safe? And use that checklist as a guide because there's a lot more tips on home safety, that could actually be a whole talk within itself, but we don't have time today to cover all of it. I'm just pointing that out, that making your home more safe and using a home safety checklist is helpful to prevent falls. You can also, uh, some people also do uh, add equipment to their home to reduce the risk of falling, especially in the bathroom, grab bars, handheld shower, hose, and then a place to sit down in the bathroom, like a shower chair or a tub bench are very common modifications people make to their bathroom. And truthfully, you can get most of them for, for not that much money. Um, grab bars should be securely bolted into the studs, not just screwed into the wall with little screws like a towel rack, because if you're gonna have a grab bar, you're probably gonna put some weight on it and it should be mounted into the studs to make sure it can it can support your weight and it won't fall out of the wall. There are some decorative grab bars now that you can find that you can't even tell it's a grab bar. It just looks like a towel rack or a toilet paper holder or something like that. And then you see there's a reacher here. This can help people if they just had like a hip or knee surgery and they can't bend down to the ground. Um, the walker, the cane, different assistive devices, trekking poles for outdoors, 
for some people. Those are all helpful. Your doctor or physical therapist can recommend to you what type of assistive device might help for your balance. And then you see this emergency alert system here. This is an important thing to think about because if somebody falls, we wanna make sure they can call for help right away if they can't get up safely on their own. And so you can consider, you know, if you might want an emergency alert system or you might have a system with someone in your family or one of your neighbors that just checks on you every day to make sure you're okay. Uh, the, the goal being that if you do have a fall and if you cannot get up on your own, that you wouldn't be down on the ground for too long without somebody discovering that you're down there and getting you help. A lot of times people will end up also getting a lockbox for their front door that will have a copy of their key so that if the fire department or the paramedics do respond to your home, they don't have to break your door down or bust in a window. They can just get the lockbox code um, from your emergency alert uh, company, or you can provide the lockbox code to the fire department in your local neighborhood, and then they can open the lockbox when they arrive at your place and open the front door with the key instead of breaking down the door or busting in through a window if you're on the ground and you can't let them in. So a lockbox you can get at Home Depot and then just make a copy of your key, put it in there and then notify the fire department, the local fire department or the emergency alert company what the lockbox code is. So what free programs does San Diego County have to help you with this? Well, we have the Fall Prevention Task Force, as I mentioned, which provides a lot of free resources. That's where the home safety checklist came from. And then we have these programs called Healthier Living with Chronic Conditions, Healthier Living with Chronic Pain, and Healthier Living with Diabetes. We also have free Tai Chi classes to work with you on your balance. And we have free, what are called Feeling Fit club classes. And so um, you can find out all about that at healthierlivingsd.org. And then also that's part of the handouts that I provided for all the participants in today's webinar. You can look through the handouts and you can see the schedule of the Feeling Fit clubs. And then you can get the information about the Tai Chi and the Healthier Living with Chronic Conditions, all those free programs offered here in San Diego County. So the website is healthierlivingsd.org and you can look at the handouts I provided to um, learn more about that. So just to review, we've covered helpful tips regarding preventing falls. Of course, we can't say 100% for sure that we can absolutely prevent falling, but the research is clear that the more risk factors you intervene to improve, the exponential impact it has on reducing your risk of falling. So if you speak up, talking to your doctor about your chronic health conditions, your medications, if you keep moving by getting the proper footwear and either doing some kind of fitness or some kind of physical therapy, and then if you're dizzy, have vertigo, or you're chronically off balance with no reasonable explanation, you could see a vestibular physical therapist, if you get your eye health checked by an ophthalmologist for any eye diseases and you get your eyes checked by an optometrist to make sure that you have the right glasses every year. And if you take steps to make your home more safe, for example, securing throw rugs, improving the lighting, um, reducing the clutter, and maybe even installing some grab bars into your shower, for example, if you do steps, to reduce the risk of falling by modifying some of these risk factors, it will have an exponential effect on reducing the likelihood that you're gonna fall. And when is the time to do this? Now, now is the time to do it. Especially if you're afraid of falling, if you feel unsteady on your feet, or if you've fallen within the last six months, now is the time to do it to prevent another fall or prevent a future fall which could result in injury or cause you not to be able to return home or live alone. So I'm so honored to present this to you today for the UCSD Retirees Association. And I wanna let you know, I've done three lectures for UCSD Stein Public Lectures. They are all available on UCTV for free. I did one on taking steps to prevent falls back in 2016 very similar to what I talked about here, but maybe some different um, points, some different tips could be in that. The 
one in the middle here, Dizziness and Vertigo Research on Aging is my most popular lecture online. It's about 90 minutes long and it's on dizziness and vertigo. And I have a panel of different healthcare providers. It's that particular video has well over 3 million views right now. And uh, I get a lot of comments on how people said it's really helped them understand dizziness and vertigo. And then I did a part two of that, which interestingly, I talked way too fast. I way over prepared for that dizziness and vertigo part two. I had way too much to say. So if you do decide to watch that, it's very informative, but I would suggest that you slow the video speed down. Um, there's a way you can do that on, on the website, just to slow the video down and watch it at like three quarters speed so you can hear what I'm saying. Okay, if you have any questions for me or you'd like to contact me to clarify anything I presented today, you're welcome to visit my website, betterbalanceinlife.com. Um, and I have a contact form you can use and you send it in and I'll receive your email and then I'll get back to you usually within three business days. And we do have about seven minutes right now for some question and answer. If anyone has a question, um, you can put it in the chat and we'll look, take a look at that and try to respond to those. And then if you want to learn more about the San Diego Fall Prevention Task Force, this is the phone number you can call. This is the same phone number for the healthier living programs as well. There's a, an, a phone number, an email, and a website there for you. Okay. Thank you so much, Jay. I Thank see you. Victoria Powell unmuted herself. Victoria, did you have a comment or a question? Um, I did have a comment. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, and it's about glasses. And it's a very easy thing to do away with the, the danger that glasses can provide most people my age wear multifocal lenses. Sure. And I do that. And people, the taller your lenses, like big round lenses that go way down over your cheeks are more dangerous than smaller lenses if you're on a multifocal lens, because you're much more likely to be looking down through the reading part of the lens and not just going up and down stairs, but hitting a slightly higher spot in a sidewalk or something like that. Sure, that's a good point. Totally avoided if you just wear glasses that are more, uh, you know, just smaller and don't force you to look through the reading prescription as you're walking around. So it's a minor point, but if it helps anybody, it helped me. So that, that's a great uh, tip. Thought it was worth sharing. Yeah. Thank you. That's a wonderful tip. Does anyone have else have one. any questions or comments? We've got about five minutes still. If anyone wants to ask a question or comment, you can unmute or you can type it into the chat. Vanya, you're muted. There yeah. You okay. <laughs> For anyone interested, we had a, a program a few months ago on gardening with um, tips there. If you're gardening, to not fall over, just gravel and all all that kind of stuff. So Great. if you're interested in that, check out our YouTube channel. Um, I'll forward that to you too, Kim, in case that's of interest. Um, thank you. But thank you so much. This was very helpful. Um, and I'll go ahead and share the handouts with those who weren't able to make it but did sign up as well. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I think there's, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven handouts that you have posted here that I shared with you. That's great. Thank you so much. Of okay, course. everybody. Have a great well, day, everyone. Thank you for your attention. Have a wonderful day.